Good morning and welcome. It's lovely to see you all here today. Sorry if I woke some of you up just now. Uh, I tend to get excited. Let's turn our attention heavenward. Let's get into our psalm today. This is Psalm 140, verses 6 through 13. O Lord, I say to you, you are my God. Hear, O Lord, my cry for mercy. O sovereign Lord, my strong deliverer, who shields my head in the day of battle. Do not grant the wicked their desires, O Lord. Do not let their plans succeed, or they will become proud. Let the, head, the heads of those who surround me be covered with the trouble that their lips have caused. Let burning coals fall upon them that they may be thrown into the fire, into the miry pit never to rise. Let slanders not be established in the land. May disaster hunt down men of violence. I know that the Lord secures justice for the poor and upholds the cause of the needy. Surely the righteous will praise your name and the upright will live before you. Let's take a moment to quiet our hearts and then we'll begin our service with prayer. Lord God, thank you that you are indeed a mighty and powerful God. That you are more than capable to deliver, to safeguard us. Thank you that you are our shield, that you protect us. Thank you that you care about justice and the needs of those who are weak. Thank you that you will deliver and that you do judge. Father, we ask for mercy. We ask that you would work. And we also thank you for the wonderful blessing we have to be a part of your family, to gather here today to worship you, to praise you, to learn from your word. We ask that you would meet with us, that your spirit would be at work in our lives, that you would be opening our eyes to what you have for us in your word. And we ask that you would truly be glorified and honored in the praises of our lips as we sing worship to you. Thank you that we have this opportunity to praise your name. I ask all this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. If you will go ahead and stand, we will sing a couple songs together.
kids, there's only a few of you today, but we are going to have Sunday school. Just a quick note for parents, next week we are shifting the Sunday school time to the 9 o'clock service. That will allow more families to be a part of that, uh, that Sunday school opportunity. So kids, let's pray, and then we're going to head downstairs. Heavenly Father, thank you for your many blessings in our life. In particular, we thank you for the blessing of kids. Thank you for this opportunity that they have to study your word. We ask that you would be at work in their lives through the teachers teaching them. I ask this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Good morning, kids. I have a challenge for you today. I want you to go get a scarf, just a regular old scarf. And my challenge to you is grab onto both ends and then see if you can tie a knot in it. You can't let go, okay? Once you grab onto this, you need to hold on until after the knot is tied. It is possible. I can do it. And I'll show it to you in a second. But I want you to see if you can figure it out first. All right, so go ahead and try that. How did it go? Were you all successful? Maybe some of you were. Maybe some of you are, are scratching your head a bit. But I can do it. Do you believe me? I know how to do this. There is a method to it. If you trust me, I'm going to show you how it works. All right? You ready? The first thing you have to do is you don't start with your hands like this. You actually cross your arms. And then, see if I can grab it. Then, once your arms are crossed, you grab on to the ends. So, see, I'm holding on to this tightly. I'm not letting go. Same with this one, holding on here. And then, holding on tight, you just uncross your arms. And ta-da, there's a knot. Now you can see that I was telling the truth. Now you can see that I did know what I was doing, that I'm able to tie a knot and a scarf without letting go of the ends. But... That's not actually belief. If you trusted me before you saw it, that's faith. That's actually believing me. If you trust me afterwards, that's just because you saw the evidence. And the Bible actually tells us this. In Hebrews 11, verse 1, we're told, Now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. That willingness to trust someone even though you don't get it is an, as a necessary part a crucial ingredient, if you will, of true faith. And this is the kind of faith we want to be placing in God. There are so many amazing promises we find in God's Word. And I look forward to seeing how God's going to fulfill them in the future. But I'll also be the first to say, I don't get it. I don't know how He's going to do it. And that's all right. In fact, that is part of having faith, is a willingness to say, God is trustworthy. I believe His promises, even though I don't understand just like this scarf, if you believed I could do it even though you didn't know how I was going to do it, that's faith. And we want to exercise this same type of faith, but to a much greater amount. As we follow God, we place our faith in Him, and we are sure of those things that we do not yet see. Our uh, scripture reading today is Genesis 39, 1-18. Now Joseph had, taken down to Egypt, was taken, had been taken down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, captain of a guard, an Egyptian, bought him from, Ishmael, um, from the Ishmaelite who had taken him down there. The Lord was with Joseph, and he was a successful man, and he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. And his master saw that the Lord was with him, and that the Lord made all he did prosper in his hand. So Joseph found favor in his sight and served him. Then he made him overseer of his house. And all that he had, he put under his authority. So it was from that time that he, that he made him overseer of his house, and all that he had, that the Lord had blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake, and that the blessing of the Lord was on all that he had in the house and in the field. Thus he left all that he had in Joseph's hand, and he did not know what he had except for the bread which he ate. Now Joseph was, a handsome, was handsome in form and appearance. And it came to pass after these things that his master's wife cast a long, or master's wife cast longing eyes on Joseph, and she said, "Lie with me." But he refused and said to his master's wife, "Look, my master does not know what it is or what is with me in the house, and he has committed all that he has to my hands. There is no one greater in this house than I, nor has he kept anything from me but you, 
because you are his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? So it, so it was, as she spoke to Joseph day by day, that he did not heed her, to lie with her or to be with her. But it happened about this time when Joseph went into the house to do his work, and none of the men of the house was inside, that she caught him by his garment, saying, Lie with me. But he left his garment in her hand and fled and ran outside. And so it was when she, had, when she saw that he had left his garment in her hand and fled outside, that she called to the men of her house and spoke to them, saying, See, he has brought, us, uh, brought to us a Hebrew to mock us. He came, with me to lie, or came to, me, to me to lie with me. And I cried out with a loud voice. And it happened when he heard that I lifted my voice and cried out that he le left his garment with me and fled and went outside. So she kept his garment with her until his master came home. Then she spoke with, uh, with words like these, saying, The Hebrew servant whom you brought, us to, brought to us came to mock me. So it happened as I lifted my voice and cried out that he left his garment with me and fled outside. Well, thank you, Joel, for reading that passage for us. <clears throat> That's the passage we're going to be looking at this morning as we work our way through uh, Genesis and the life of Joseph. <clears throat> but before we go there, we're going to spend some time praying. Praying for the family of the week, which is Don and Darlene Nixon. And then we have some missionaries that we support, the Modis. The communities of the week, we're now in uh, Spruce Grove. We've, I mean, we're now in Stony Plain. We've covered the communities in Spruce Grove. So we'll be praying for the Jutland Ridge, Sun Meadows, and Sandstone, Silverstone. So <clears throat> why don't you join with me as I pray. And uh, we'll trust that the Lord hears and answers. Lord Jesus, we thank you so much that we can come into your throne room, <clears throat> the headquarters of the universe, where you rule and reign and oversee everything that takes place in this cosmos, Lord. We have such a great privilege with this open door access that you've given to us in Christ Jesus. And Lord, we want to avail of this great privilege and help us to pray according to your will and in your spirit and in faith. Because we know that when you hear our prayers, you answer them in ways that exceed our asking. And you, ways, and you answer in ways that bring glory to your name. Thank you for Don and Darlene Nixon, Lord, and their um, involvement with this family here at Parkland Baptist. And thank you now that they're enjoying the sunshine in Phoenix. Lord, I just pray that you'd be with them in a powerful way that you would manifest your love to them not only today but throughout this week, that your favor would rest on them in a special way. The Lord is a fellowship down there with a, a church in Phoenix. Lord, that they would just be encouraged and minister to and that they would be a blessing to those around them as well. So Lord, we just commit them to you and thank you for them. Thank you for the Modis, Lord, and their ministry in Romania. The churches that, uh, he, that uh, he pastors, Miklos, and Lord, that you would give him strength as he goes from church to church to equip your people to preach the gospel and to win unbelievers to yourself. May you just continue to use them in powerful ways down there in Romania. Lord, that you would continue to give them vision and strength, both of them, as he and his wife. And Lord, we just lift them up to you that even this week they would sense your presence in a special way, that you would provide for them and <clears throat> according to their needs, that whatever they, they have need of, Lord, that you would supply them. And Lord, we thank you that we can beseech the Lord of the harvest and that we can ask that you send out workers into your harvest field. And we think of these three communities in Stony Plain, Jutland Ridge, and Sun Meadows, and Sandstone, Silverstone. Lord, we just pray that all the families in these three communities would have opportunity to hear the message of the gospel. That you would send people into their lives, you know, you know, whether workmates, family, neighbors, whoever, and however. And even the online services, Lord, that your word would go out and, and that faith comes by hearing and then hearing the word of God. And so, Lord, your word is not restrained or restricted, but may, may it go forth. 
And Lord, may you even use us in that process, that you would use us here in, this, in the tri-region. And Lord, we want to pray for our governing leaders at all three levels. Mayor Stuart Houston and his council, city council, and Premier Jason Kenney and his uh, parliament, as well as Prime Minister Justin Trudeau and the federal cabinet. Oh God, there's so much going on, <clears throat> not only with COVID and everything associated with it. Again, Lord Jesus, we pray that you would diminish all this virus, the cases and amount of hospitalizations and the measures and the masking, everything, Lord, that just would be diminished. That you would restore things back to a semblance of normalcy again. Lord, we thank you that we can get into your word. May your Holy Spirit instruct us. The ministry of the Spirit is to instruct your people, to remind us of the things we've forgotten, and to instruct us in the things that we don't know. May we have ears to hear what it is that you're saying, and Lord, not only would we be hearers of your word, but even more so doers of your word. And I just pray that as I speak your word, that your grace would pour forth through my lips, and Lord, that what is of you, Father, would find good uh, soil in our hearts and bear fruit in what's not of you, Lord. I just pray to fall by the wayside. Lord, that we would be encouraged by you. And we thank you, Lord, that you're here with us this, this morning. We commit the remainder of this service to you in the name of Christ Jesus and for your glory. Amen. <clears throat> well, thank you for praying with me and standing with me as we bring these matters to the Lord. And so, as I said, we are working our way through uh, Genesis, and we're looking at the life of Joseph, <clears throat> chapter 39. And again, thanks, Joel, for reading that passage for us. And so, basically, Joseph arrived in, in Egypt, and he was 18 years old when he, uh, when he got there. <clears throat> and he was in Egypt for until 110. 110 years old, and and uh, he died in Egypt as well. And so 80 years, 80 of those years that Joseph was in Egypt was filled with incredible success. He just was elevated over and over again and finally ends up as the second in command in the land of Egypt, as we'll see in a few weeks. But it was a success that was mixed with uh, many setbacks. We're going to see that setback today. We can say, we could even say that Joseph's life is one of a rags to riches story, back to rags, back to riches. <clears throat> and his life teaches us. This is kind of the, the principle we want to weave through this message today. His life teaches us that before we can be trusted with life's advances, we have to learn from life's adversities. That's what we're going to see in the life of Joseph, especially today and in the weeks ahead. But before we, be, we can be trusted with life's advances, we have to learn from life's adversities. And so let's go there. Genesis 39. If you have your Bibles or smartphones or however you choose to read your scriptures, Let's go to Genesis 39, verses 1 and 2. It says, Now Joseph had been taken down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an Egyptian officer, Pharaoh, the captain of the bodyguard, brought him from the Ishlamites, who had taken him down there. And the Lord was with Joseph. So he became a successful man, and he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. And so we'll stop there, make a few comments. And Joseph's story is not about his success, it's more about the reason behind his success. And despite all the setbacks that Joseph experienced, the Lord was with him. The Lord was with him when he was sold by his brothers. The Lord was with him when he went down to Egypt. The Lord was with him when he was purchased by Potiphar. And we're going to see the Lord was with him when he faced temptation. And so Joseph's success was grounded in his walk with the Lord. In fact, we see a similar principle at work if we go to uh, 2 Chronicles chapter 26, 
verses 5, and those verses should appear on the screen here. King Uzziah, who was the king of Judah, his success was related to his walk with the Lord. Notice what it says in verse 5 of 2 Chronicles 26. It says, he continued to seek God, he, and be, he being Uzziah, in the days of Zechariah, who had understanding through the vision of God, and as long as he sought the Lord, God prospered him. And so our success is grounded in our walk with the Lord. And so in verses 3 of chapter 39, it says, Now his master saw that the Lord was with him, and how the Lord caused all that he did to prosper in his hand. So Joseph found favor in his sight and became his personal servant, and he made him overseer over his house, and all that he owned he put in his charge. In verse 5, it came about that from the time he made him overseer in his house, and over all that he owned, the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house on account of Joseph. Thus the Lord's blessing was upon all that he owned in the house and in the field. Verse 6, so he left everything he owned in Joseph's charge, and with him there he did not concern himself with anything except the food which he ate. And we'll stop there. And so as we see here in these passages, everything Joseph did turned to gold. Everything that was under his care flourished. When Joseph was in the fields, the fields were blessed. When Joseph was in the house, the house was blessed. In fact, it appears that through Joseph, the seed of the Abrahamic covenant was starting to take root. Well, what is the Abrahamic covenant? Well, let's go to Genesis chapter 12, verse, uh, verse 3. Genesis 12, verse 3 says, the Lord says to Abraham, I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth will be blessed. And so Joseph, being a descendant of Abraham, was a blessing to Potiphar, and later to the Egyptians and to many peoples. And so here this is not so much a story about the success of Joseph, it is a story about God's faithfulness to his promises. So Joseph's blessing from the Lord was so out of the ordinary. It was so, I guess we could say, supernatural that Potiphar discerned that his success could only be ascribed to Joseph's God. His success was a testimony to the Lord. And as a result, Joseph at Potiphar's fullest confidence. And thus Joseph moved upward. He was promoted to the second in command. <clears throat> Someone mentioned to me after the first service that likely all the other servants in the house may have resented Joseph for that. And we will see maybe how that plays out as we go through this passage. You know, Potiphar may have been thinking that better left with Joseph than with me. It succeeds more in his hands than it does in mine. And so he entrusted everything to him. He felt secure that all was in good hands because the Lord brought success to all that Joseph set out to do for Potiphar. And so here this 18-year-old was put in charge of Potiphar's entire estate. And I'm sure that estate was pretty large. And so I want us to make a few applications here before we move on in this passage. The first thing is this. I think what we can learn from this is that being faithful in the smaller things in life leads to an enlarged fear of influence. If you notice Joseph's progress, he began as part of his personal servant and he was faithful in that role. And then he was promoted to oversee his household, and then he proved to be faithful in that role, and then he was entrusted with the entire estate. And so I believe that as we are found faithful in smaller matters, the Lord will entrust to us more and more. If we go to Matthew chapter 25, Jesus salutes to this in the parable of the talents. Notice what he says in verse 21 of Matthew 25. 
He said, his master said to them, said to him, well done, good and faithful slave. And that's exactly what Joseph was. He was a faithful slave in, his, in part of his house. You were faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. And so we see here that when we are found faithful in smaller matters, the Lord entrusts to us greater and greater ventures. The second thing that we can learn from this passage here in in Genesis 39, is that because the Lord is with you, you will be a blessing to others. So much so that others will seek you out. They will seek your services. You will be an asset to them, regardless of whether or not they believe in the Lord. The blessing of your life, or sorry, the blessing of the Lord in your life, will open doors of opportunity and serve as a testimony in your place of work, in your family, in your classroom, and in the communities in which you live. Now all was going well with Joseph. He was blessed by the Lord. He was trusted by his master, but then out of the blue, he faced a crisis. And the crisis came when Joseph was on the top of his game when he was experiencing incredible success, he encountered adversity. Now let's look at verses, the second half of verse six and seven. Now Joseph was handsome in form and appearance. And it came about after these things that his master's wife looked with desire at Joseph and she said, lie with me. And so here Joseph's faith had a role in his success but now we're finding his looks played a role in his setback. God's blessing was the cause of his advance, but his beauty was the cause of his ad adversity. And so as I mentioned, while at the top of his game here, Joseph suddenly was brought face to face with adversity. I believe the devil wanted to ruin Joseph's life in order to bring his prophetic dreams to an end. The evil the evil, one, the evil schemes of Joseph's brother did not prevail. Now Satan will use the schemes of Potiphar's wife to try and bring him down. Now I'm going to call Potiphar's wife Mrs. Potiphar just for the sake of this message, make it a little bit easier. Well, she admired Joseph's success, and she was inflamed with his looks. I'm sure... Potiphar's wife would never dream of consorting with a slave. There was lots of slaves in the house, lots of other male servants in there. She would never dream of consorting with them. But because she admired Joseph's success, and because she was taken by his looks, she desired to have him. And she even used her authority to command him to lie with her. This is a command, it's not a, a request. But with resolve here, G uh, Joseph rebuffed her advances again and again because the Lord was with him. And it was because the Lord was with him that he could resist temptation. You know, when life is going well, when we are experiencing the blessing of the Lord, when our efforts are prospering, it is then we need to be on guard. Because it is then we are in danger of an attack from the evil one. And I believe before we embark on a life of success, before we enter into the ventures that God has for us, we need to settle in our mind what is permissible and what is not. We need to establish that before and not during. The time to set biblical boundaries it's not when facing temptation, the time to set biblical boundaries is before it happens. And so we set biblical boundaries to prepare for temptation. And then in verse 8 and 9, it says, But he refused and said to his master's wife, Behold, with me here, my master does not concern himself with anything in the house, and he has put all that he owns in my charge. He's giving a reason for why he's rebuffing her advances. There is no one greater in this house than I. 
and he has withheld nothing from me except you because you are his wife. How then could I do this great evil and sin against God? Now it is not sin to be tempted. Jesus was tempted. That was not the sin. It is sin to yield to temptation. And so Joseph could face the temptation here because he had already established his biblical boundaries. And here we find him rebuffing Mrs. Potiphar's advances on three grounds. The first is that Joseph could not abuse the great trust that Potiphar placed in him. Had he succumbed to her desires, or had he succumbed to his own desires, all that he worked for would come crashing down. It would ruin his standing with Potiphar. The second reason for rebuffing this is Potiphar's advances was Joseph determined that he would not offend his master by having his master's wife. And lastly, he rebuffed because the Lord was with him and he was not willing to sin against the Lord. You know, we can hide our sinful actions from others, but we can never hide our sin from the Lord. And often I think when we flirt with temptation, we neglect to take into account how our sin offends the Lord. You know, I often hear the excuse, well, if it doesn't hurt anybody, then what's wrong with what I'm doing? Well, I think the question that we need to ask ourselves is how does my action affect my walk with the Lord? Sinning against the Lord is to transgress the boundaries he has put in place and as followers of Jesus, we have an important role in God's program. Just like Joseph had an important role in God's program. No matter who we are, no matter our age, we have an important role in God's program. And unconfessed sin will disqualify us from that role. However, once the sin is confessed and dealt with, then we are restored. Now, David, the king of Israel, his whole life came crashing down as a result of his sin, the sin of adultery, and then he covers up that sin by murdering Bathsheba's husband or having him killed. And notice what he says in Psalm 51, verse 4. He doesn't say against Bathsheba have I sinned, or against Uriah have I sinned. Notice what he says, against you, God, and you only I have sinned, and done what is evil in your sight. And so in the end, all sin is against God. And Joseph knew that. He said, how can I sin against God? You know, when life is going well, when we experience the blessing of the Lord, when everything we do prospers, keep your guard up. Because it is then we are vulnerable to the schemes of the evil one. And even though we may have established our boundaries beforehand, we are still weak. And so not only should we prepare for temptation, we should also pray against temptation. In fact, Jesus teaches that. In Matthew chapter 6. A great prayer, the Lord's Prayer, some call it the Disciples' Prayer. Chapter 6, verse 13, notice what Jesus says in, in the prayer that he teaches us. And do not lead us into temptation. That is something we are to pray. But deliver us from the evil one. And so we should prepare for temptation by establishing the biblical boundaries beforehand. And we should pray against temptation. And the third thing we're going to see is we should also flee from temptation. Let's go to Genesis 39 again. Let's look at verses 10 to 12. It says, and as she spoke to Joseph day after day, he did not listen to her to lie beside her or be with her. Now it happened one day that he went into the house to do his work and none of the men of the household were there inside. She caught him by his garment saying, lie with me. And he left his garment in her hand and fled 
and went outside. So what we're seeing here is the temptation is relentless, it is persistent. Mr. Mrs. Potiphar sought to entice Joseph many, many times. In fact, it appears her advances may have gone on, just not day after day, but for months. She may have tried to entice him with compliments. She may have tried to seduce him by wearing suggestive clothing. She may have tried to get his attention by making herself look more attractive. This went on for a long time. You know, it may be easier to resist the first few times, but after a series of attempts, it becomes harder and harder to resist temptation. It may get to the point where we start to spiritualize things, or we start to rationalize. You know, Joseph could have said to himself, I'm, I know he didn't, but he could have, let's imagine. He could have said to himself, well, you know, maybe the Lord led me to Egypt so that I can minister to Mrs. Potiphar. Maybe that's why this is happening. Right? Start to rationalize it. Start to spiritualize it. Well, here Joseph was not even willing to spend time with her. He says, it says here, it says he didn't even want to be with her. He refused to be alone with Mrs. Potiphar, even to chat with her. But then, one day, here Joseph entered his ho the house with the intent of doing his work, as he has always done. He was busy, faithfully serving his master, going out of his business as usual. But on that day, you know, Joseph must have been puzzled as to why are none of the other servants here in this house? It's interesting that the writer brings that out. He says, he says that, um, <clears throat> he says in, in verse 11, and none of the men of the household were there in size. Why does that detail include it in the, in the narrative, in this passage? Maybe Mrs. Potiphar gave her servants the day off because she didn't want anyone around. She didn't want any witnesses around because she was scheming something. But one thing we know from Scripture that when facing temptation, the Lord promises that he would always provide a way of escape. And often the way of escape involves fleeing. Sometimes the wisest course of action is to flee temptation rather than to fight it. The safest recourse is to physically remove ourselves from the source of temptation. In fact, Paul talks about this in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. No temptation has overtaken you, but such is common to man. And God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able. But with the temptation, God will provide the way of escape also so that you may be able to endure it. And so with every temptation, the Lord is with us to provide a way of escape. And often temptation can be overcome simply by walking away. And so the cowardly thing to do is to remain in the presence of temptation, try to fight it. But actually the more courageous thing to do is not to fight it, but to flee from it. And even though Joseph's garment would be used against him. He didn't go back and retrieve it. I mean, I thought that that would probably be the better thing to do is just go back and get that garment, but he didn't even want to go back to retrieve it. He refused to linger even for a moment in the presence of temptation. And so because the Lord is with us, <clears throat> we will be a blessing to others. And such blessing will open doors of opportunity for service. Such blessing will serve as a witness for the Lord. But with advance in the things of God comes adversity. Comes adversity from the evil one. And we need to be ready for it. We need to expect it. Even when we're at the top of our game. And so we need to prepare for temptation by establishing beforehand the biblical boundaries. We need to pray against temptation. And we need to physically distance ourselves from the source of temptation. Now let's look at how Joseph was framed in verses 13 to 18. Let's go to 13. When she saw that he had left his garment in her hand and had fled outside, she called the men of her household and said to them, See, he has brought in a Hebrew to us to make sport of us. 
He came in to me to lie with me, and I screamed. And when he heard that I raised my voice and screamed, he left his garment beside me and fled out and fled and went outside. So she left his garment beside her until his master came home. I believe Mrs. Potiphar was humiliated by Joseph's continual refusal, refusals to her advances. So her desire for Joseph turned to disdain. Joseph's resistance was met with her revenge. And sadly, her revenge won out in the short run. We will see that in future messages that God used it all for good. You know, I'm not sure Potiphar would believe his wife's story. We'll see why in a little bit. So I think she summoned her servants to rally behind her as she displayed this evidence, this contrived evidence. You know, she held up Joseph's garment for all to see and then crafted a false narrative around it, kind of like what happened in the previous chapter we looked at, right? The garment of Joseph again was used as contrived evidence to craft a narrative. Garments play a big role in Joseph's life. So here, Mrs. Potiphar, I believe, painted Joseph in a bad light. She calls him like one of these Hebrews to make sport of us. She persuaded the male servants in our house that Joseph was a Hebrew and that as a Hebrew, he was our enemy. She appealed to their prejudice toward the Hebrew people. In fact, if you go to Genesis 43, Genesis 43, 32, we get an inside look as to how the Egyptian, what the Egyptians thought of the Hebrew people. It says, for the Egyptians could not eat bread with the Hebrews, for that is loathed them. It's an the word is abomination to the Egyptians. To hang out with the Hebrews was an abomination to the Egyptians. And so she's appealing to their prejudice. And because of the evidence of the garment, you know, the, the male servants probably thought, well, man, there must be some truth to, to what she's saying here. She's got a garment to prove it, and so they rallied behind her cause in order to support her narrative so that when she relates the events to her husband, she'll have some people to back her up. But I want you to notice something here a little bit. It kind of, we don't, it's, well, it's there, but it's, we sometimes pass over it. Notice how she manipulated the evidence. She did not say, he left his garment in my hand. Right? What did she tell the men of the house there? <clears throat> she said, he left his garment beside me. She didn't say he left his garment in my hand. If she had said that, probably the servants would think, oh, wow, well, she's the one that seized Joseph's garment against his will. So here she manipulates the evidence by saying, Joseph left the garment beside me, which then makes it appear that it was Joseph who disrobed himself only to flee when she screamed. So she fabricated or contrived or manipulated the evidence so that she could create a false narrative. Now in verse 17, then it says this, Then she spoke to him, her husband, with these words, The Hebrew slave, whom you brought to us, came in to make sport of me. And says, I raised my voice and screamed. He left his garment beside me and fled outside. You know, it appears that Potiphar's marriage was under strain. Sounds like she's blaming her husband. He says, The Hebrew slave whom you brought to us, She's blaming her husband for arranging the circumstances that allowed this scenario to take place. But the question is, did Potiphar believe her story? Well, many commentators suggest that had Potiphar believed the story, Joseph would have been put to death for the crime of attempted rape, because that's what happened in that culture at that time. It was at a capital crime, and they would be executed. 
And so the fact that Joseph was given a lighter sentence and not the death penalty suggests Potiphar was not fully convinced of Joseph's guilt. So then why did he do what he did? Some say that he did, he did what he did, put him in prison to appease his wife. We don't know, but that's what some commentators suggest. So in conclusion, just a few points here, by way of application, also by way of review. The first is this, know that the Lord is with you to bless you. So that you, in turn, might be a powerful witness for the Lord Jesus. The Lord blesses us so that we can be a blessing to others. And by being a blessing to others, we are being a powerful witness for the Lord. Just as Joseph was a powerful witness for the Lord in Potiphar's household because of the blessing of God in the same way, the Lord is with you to bless you so that you might be a blessing to others. The second thing is this, know that the Lord is with you to overcome temptation so that you might advance in the things of God. As we overcome temptation, we move forward into the things that God has for us. Remember, as I mentioned earlier on, before we can be trusted with life's advances, we have to learn from life's adversities. And so we prepare for temptation by setting those biblical boundaries in advance. We prepare for temptation even by praying against temptation. And we also prepare for temptation even by physically distancing ourselves from temptation. Evil may have its victories, but they are always short-lived. You know, overcoming temptation did not bring Joseph immediate reward. Even though he was victorious over this temptation, he ended up in prison, still. And so resisting temptation is always the right thing to do, even if it results in a temporary setback. Because before we can be trusted with life's advances, we have to learn from life's adversities. Why don't we spend some time praying? Lord, we thank you so much that you are with us. And just as you were with Joseph, you are with us even now. And just as you blessed Joseph, you bless us as well. And that blessing opened doors of opportunity for Joseph, and that blessing served as a testimony for your, for your namesake in the same way, Lord. May the blessing that you confer on us open doors of opportunity for service and may the blessing that you confer on us also be a testimony for your great name. But Lord, we also recognize that with your blessing and as we advance in, in your purposes, we also encounter temptation, sometimes intense temptation. Lord, I just pray that you would help us all to be overcomers. Lord, that we would be prepared for this and and know where we stand and have those biblical principles established. And Lord, that we would even be praying, Lord, not that we would not be led into temptation. But when we are, Lord, that we would avail of ourselves of the way of escape. That we wouldn't flirt with it, but flee from it. And Lord, we just thank you so much that as we overcome these things that you entrust to us more and more, may we be found faithful in the small things that you entrust to us and therefore be entrusted with greater things. So Lord, we just commit ourselves to you anew. We commit ourselves to you afresh. And Lord, we pray that you would use us individually in our sphere of influence and that you would use us as a church body in this community. We pray these things in the name of Christ Jesus and for your glory. Amen. Well, why don't we stand for one uh, closing song and then we will finish with a benediction.
Well, we've been talking about blessing and just how, because the Lord is with us, He blesses us. <clears throat> and though we are blessed, we are to be channels of blessing. We are to be vessels of His blessing. And so I want to, I want you to receive this blessing as from the Lord. It's not me that blesses. I have no power to bless, but the Lord certainly does, and it is His will to bless. So if you're comfortable... You can raise your hands as a symbol of receiving a blessing from the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance on you and give you his peace. May you go in the grace of God and the blessing of God and in the shalom of God, not only today, but throughout this week. In the name of Christ Jesus and for his glory. Amen.